Shalom, this is Reverend John Ferret, and we are in Lesson 98 in the continuing Torah series, The Gospel According to Moses, on the book of Genesis. And we're at Genesis chapter 47. We're getting close to the end of completing this first book of Torah. Now, I wanted to thank Dennis Prager, again, a renowned very credible, very conservative talk show host, and also a deeply religious Jew, a man who believes in God. And he has provided some commentary on some verses in Genesis 46 that are really amazing. Again, I thank God for the Lord giving me Jewish teachers and Christian teachers that are just definitely uh, credible, trustworthy, and definitely scholarly in a, in a real way, and also ones that verify the very words of God. And Dennis, uh, one of the things that he's done again is he has provided Torah study in audio series, an audio series that lasted 25 years. He went through, I mean, Genesis 1-1 all the way through Genesis chapter 50, just amazing in detail. And there's an awful lot of detail that he gives us, and that's why I wanted to comment on these three verses, because there's a couple of things that I didn't see, and I have to thank again Dennis Prager. He adds to my understanding and my grasp of what God is getting at in these specific verses, and also understanding the Bible in a better way. And it's just a great example that, again, you just can't read the Bible. Like, okay, maybe some of you are reading the Bible in one year. That That's a great thing. And you may have the one-year Bible. That's a, that's a great thing. I got no problem with that. But that's not enough. You're going to see here, when we take a look at these three verses, just in the last few verses of Genesis 46, how important it is to get good Bible study, good Bible instruction, both from Jewish scholars, Jewish Messianic scholars, and Christian scholars. For all of us, study is required. Dennis Prager said that he's not much of a prayer, prayer warrior, um, and prayer for him is difficult. But he said for him... He worships God when he studies. And it's very interesting. He's not alone in that. Because in Jesus' day, the highest form of worship was study, not reading. The highest form of worship was not going to the temple. It was study. So with that in mind, let's consider these three verses. The first one, we're in Genesis 46. And we're going to be taking a look at verses 16 through 18. Reading from the New American Standard, it says, The sons of Gad, Ziphion and Hagi, Shuni and Ezbron, Eri and Arodi and Areli. The sons of Ashir are Imna and Ishva and Ishvi and Beriah and their sister Sarah. And the sons of Beriah, Heber, and Malkiel. So this is very interesting. We just read the phrase, their sister, in the Hebrew, is not Sarah, but Serach. And this is very interesting. We have one girl, Serach, and she is counted as part of the 70 who went down to Egypt as part of Jacob's family. You can check this for yourself. You can carefully go over the verses starting in verse 8 to 46 through 27 of 46, and you can count. You'll count 66 because at the end you have to add Jacob, Joseph, and Joseph's sons, Manasseh, uh, Manasseh and uh, Ephraim to get at the 70. But the question is, why do we have one girl counted among 69 males. Dennis Prager would share that to this day, no one can figure out why Serach is in the list. 
Why is she counted? So when we go to the JPS Torah commentary, written by Nahum Sarna, Sarna has commentary on this specific issue, and we read the following in the commentary. Serach is also specified in Numbers 2646 and in 1 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 30. So you can look those up if you want. Numbers 2646 and 1 Chronicles 7, chapter 7, verse 30. It is inconceivable that Jacob's 12 sons should have had 53 sons in all and only one daughter. That just doesn't make sense. We know there's another daughter out there, and that's Dina. In light of the general biblical tendency to omit women from the genealogies, there must be some extraordinary reason for mentioning her in this particular one, although not a hint of it is given in the text. Not a hint of it is given anywhere among Jewish scholars whatsoever. So again, if you're reading the Bible, this is not all clear. Again, we study and good with good teachers like Dennis Prager and the brilliant Nahum Sarna who wrote the uh, JPS Torah commentary for Genesis, these things are addressed and we find, is there an answer? The answer is there is no answer. The Bible is not giving us the reasons why Serach is included in there. One woman out of all the boys. Very interesting. Here's the second verse, and that's going to be Genesis 46, verse 23. Very short verse. It says, the sons of Dan, sons, plural, the sons of Dan, Hushim. And you say, uh, wait a minute, that's an error. Sons? When only one son is mentioned, Hushim? This is another very interesting curiosity. And we would ask, what's going on? And again, we have to rely on great Jewish scholars like Dennis Prager, like Nahum Sarna, great Christian scholars like the ones who wrote the IVP Bible background commentary in the Old Testament or the New Testament, and that's Craig Keener and Walton and uh, others. Or John Kareed and his Torah commentary. So these are the people we really rely on. These are great scholars, both Jewish and Christian. And they say there's no explanation. Why, all of a sudden, we have this phrase, the sons of Dan, when there's only one. So we say, is this a copying error? Copying er error? We don't have the original, you guys. The original Torah as written by Moses. We got a copy. And it was copied and copied and copied and copied again. Well, that's a possibility. Or, this might make sense. If you start in verse 8 and 46, we, hear, we see the phrase, the sons of Israel, plural. Verse 9, the sons of Reuben, and then they list the sons. He's got more than one. Verse 10, the sons of Simeon. And he's got more than one. And so we see this phrase over and over and over again. The sons of, the sons of, and so on. Now Nahum Sarna is suggesting that this was simply Moses keeping the pattern the same. Maybe. That's just a guess by Nahum Sarna. It's reasonable. I guess we're just going to have to wait and ask Moses when we see him. But again, it's just another example that simple Bible reading doesn't cut it. It doesn't give us the answers. It, it just gives us more questions. To be Bible literate, ladies and gentlemen, does not mean you've read the Bible. It means you read the Bible, you've taken classes, you study it, and you're beginning to understand God's Word. Now the third verse becomes amazingly critical for us. And this verse is Genesis 46, and we're reading 33 and 34. 
When Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? You shall say, your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth even until now, both we and our fathers, that you may live in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is loathsome to the Egyptians. Now, when we take a look at the Hebrew word used to translate uh, loathsome, it's the Hebrew word tobeah. Toeba, sorry, Toeba. And the Strong's numbers 8581. It means to be to loathe, to detest, to be disgusting, to be just forbidden. Now it's the same word that's used when we go into Leviticus, where God says, Child sacrifice is an abomination to me. Immoral sexual worship is an abomination to me. Or the moral sexual worship by pagans. Uh, adultery is an abomination. And abomination is a very strong word. So this is a very strong loathing. Again, this is not apparent when you're reading the Bible and you just read the word loathing because we don't understand the Hebrew behind it and the intensity of the Hebrew. We're going to see this in Leviticus someday, God willing. Then in other words, um, catfish. Uh, in the King James, I believe it says they're an abomination to God. No, they're not. It's not the same word, toeba. Toeba is an abomination that's severe. But eating catfish is basically not allowed. It's not toeba. It's not this extreme uh, view by God on this action. And you can't compare the two. But again, Bible reading... It just so happens that King James uses the same English word, abomination, and, it, and, and it's confusing. So anyway, in here, the Egyptians have a very strong loathing. And why is this important? We need to go deeper in our understanding. And why is it important? Because out of this, Yahweh, the Lord, God, he gives a law, matter of fact, he gives a couple of laws to the Hebrews and us. Wait till you see what I mean. He gives two laws to the Hebrews and really to us related to the way Egyptians looked upon Hebrews and the way Egyptians looked upon any stranger or non-Egyptian. John Kareed, and again, a highly credible scholar, archaeologist, Egyptologist, and leading theologian uh, in our day, he wrote a commentary on Genesis. And he addresses this when he goes into, because he's an Egyptologist, so he basically knows the history and culture of ancient Egypt. Creed says, shepherding was an abomination or anathema to the Egyptians. This is the same term that was used in Genesis 43:32, and we did discover that in previous lessons, where we were told that Joseph did not eat bread with the Hebrews because it was an abomination to the Egyptians to do so. Both customs signify racial exclusiveness on the part of the Egyptians, and this was against anyone that was a non-Egyptian. This is similar to and reminds us of the Nazis in talking about the superior race. So, the Hebrews and all foreigners were considered lower than the Egyptians. As humans, anybody that's not Egyptian does not measure up to the, to the Egyptians. They couldn't. Egyptians thought they were above everybody else. Now, the Hebrews in Egypt were called Gerim. The Strong's number is 1616. It means a stranger, an alien. As regarding Egypt, that would be a non-Egyptian resident or a non-Egyptian non-resident, a sojourner or foreigner, a visitor. Now later, these Hebrews, they were considered that the, who are unworthy non-Egyptians were enslaved and treated harshly. So God institutes a couple of laws 
in his instruction, his Torah, Torah does not mean law, it means instruction, and one of them is Leviticus 1960. It's a very, very famous verse. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, the second law is also in Leviticus, and it's related, and it's in Leviticus 19.34. The stranger who resides with you, the stranger, the ger, the ger, all right, plural is gerim, the stranger, the sojourner, the foreigner, the non-Jewish pagan who resides with you shall be to you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you, meaning Israel, were aliens, gerim, that's what it is, so we've got, we have the word stranger at the beginning of verse 34, now aliens, and it just so happens to be the same Hebrew word. You see what I mean? Reading does not give you the full impact you need to study, and you need the Hebrew behind this. The Gorim in the land of Egypt, I am the Lord, your God. So the Hebrews are non-resident. They're non-Hebrew. They're non-Egyptian residents. They're visitors. They're aliens. They're foreigners. And here's God is saying, you need to love the foreigner, the sojourner, the alien, the non-Hebrew resident or visitor, just like ourselves. Now, the Orthodox rabbis didn't like this. They actually said a gur was a convert. So, in other words, in this verse, when you're reading it, they would say, with regards to the stranger who resides with you, they would say who the convert who resides with you. Wait a minute. Convert? In, in the same verse, the Torah, God's word, contradicts the rabbis. Because it says the Hebrews were gurim. They were aliens. Were they converts? The Hebrews weren't converts. They were Hebrews. They were foreigners. They were non-Egyptians. So the rabbis have made a huge error. Only for the simple reason that are they trying to be as exclusive when they said that we are only to love our neighbor or strangers who are converts? In other words, we are only to love people who are like ourselves? That's just like the Egyptians treated the Hebrews. No. This is huge. We're going to see this as we continue on. God meant even non-resident pagans. We are to love them as ourselves. So, Gur is a neighbor, or we're treating the Gur, excuse me, in 1934, we're going to be treating the, the sojourner, the, the, the foreigner, the non Hebrew uh, resident, as a neighbor. Because in, 19, in 1934, it says to love the stranger as yourself. In 1916, it says to love your neighbor as yourself. Who is your neighbor? The stranger, the foreigner, the pagan visitor. Now, this is not the way the Hebrews were treated in Egypt, and God knew it. And he gave a new way for the Hebrews to live. He gave a new way for the Hebrews to relate to all men, all non-Hebrews all strangers or foreigners, pagan or not. Now they are to love the non-Hebrew as if they were their brothers. We see this. God even called the Egyptians the neighbors of the Hebrews. This is in Exodus 3, verse 22, and in Exodus 11, verse 2. The Egyptians are the neighbors Now, for Christians, this is so critical. Now, this is where Dennis Prager is basically, I think, blockaded by his upbringing in Orthodox Judaism, which he actually left 
and is unable because of the baggage probably he carries with him, which we all carry baggage, to actually even take this to Jesus and see how Jesus addresses our treatment of strangers and foreigners and even pagans among us and adds more to his Torah instruction that we find in Leviticus 19.16 and in Leviticus 19.34. First, Jesus says that the second great commandment of Torah is to love your neighbor as yourself. You can find this a day or two before he was crucified in Matthew 22, verse 39. That's number one. So he says the greatest commandment, second greatest commandment, is to love your neighbor as yourself. Second, Jesus does a parable, as many rabbis do, about the Good Samaritan. And if you read it carefully, who's the neighbor? Because somebody asked Jesus, who's my neighbor? And Jesus, his conclusion was, when he's telling the Jewish man who asked him the question, who then is your neighbor? Well, he never answered, it's the Samaritan. He acted like a good neighbor. And Jesus says, go and, be this, go and act like the same. Now, the Samaritans were hated by the Jews intensely. They were like enemies. And Jesus says, no, they're your neighbor, which means love your neighbor as yourself. You're to love the Samaritans just as if they were your brothers. That's the implication of Jesus' teaching. Third, Jesus really makes this intense when we go to Matthew 5, verses 43 and 44. Again, reading from the New American Standard, it says, You shall have, you have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, notice, Jesus connects this to the Leviticus 19.16. Right there, you've heard it said, love your neighbor. So it seems clear Jesus is now saying, love your enemy as your neighbor, love your enemy as yourself. Wow. Now, the first thing I want to for you to realize is that nowhere in the Bible, nowhere, Nowhere in the Torah, nowhere in the prophets, nowhere in the writings, nowhere in the entire Hebrew scriptures does it say to hate your enemy. Nowhere. The rabbis were teaching that in Jesus' day, to hate the Romans, to hate the Samaritans. And so they were being taught this. Jesus was addressing a cultural issue. Again, Bible reading is not going to help you. You need Bible reading. You need to read the Bible. And you need to write those questions down. You read to write write your thoughts down. Because once you start studying the Bible in its cultural context, we begin to see how these things are answered. Now, this idea of loving your enemy as yourself in our day seems to be so difficult for 21st century Christians. Now, this is my experience from classes that I taught. We've had some marvelous discussions about this. And one of the things that Christians seem to have a problem with is love seems to be an emotion, a good emotion, good feelings about somebody. Now, that's not true. You need to get the Jewish concept of what it means to love. Now, I'm linking you to an amazing journal that is provided at netivia.org. I told you about this messianic, scholarly um messianic site and they have on a journal that it's called love your neighbor as yourself it's all based upon leviticus 19 16 but they're messianic so they take it to jesus's words about the two greatest commandments and also to love your enemy as your neighbor how do we do that you have got to read this journal it's got numbers of great articles in there about love, and especially love in the Jewish culture of Jesus' day. It will help you so much with your understanding God's word, understanding Jesus' teaching. So again, if you go to the commentary section before you actually even click on uh, the play button for this podcast, uh, you will see uh, below that uh, place where you click on play, 
uh, some sort of a comment section where you're able to, in some cases, it'll already be opened up for you, but in many cases, like in YouTube, uh, it will say uh, something like show more, two words, and if you click on that, it will open it up. That link to that article is in that comment section. So we recall that Jesus is saying in John 5.39 that scripture testifies of, of, of him. Now all they had in Jesus' day was the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures. So it seems so clear to us that the Egyptians were looking down on the Hebrews which led to the law by God. said, Hebrews, you're not going to be like the Egyptians. You're not going to be like any other group. And he gave them the law in Leviticus 16.34 to love the stranger, the non-Jew, even the pagan as yourself. I find Dennis Prager's personal opinion with regards to the laws of Torah. And he said he really thinks loving the stranger is probably one of the most important laws of Torah. I, I agree with him. But Jesus seems to take 1634, love the stranger as yourself, and love your neighbor as yourself, and combines them. What does Jesus say? You will love everyone, not just Christians who act like yourself. So it goes on to Jesus' ex expanding our understanding of the commandments in the Torah. Now these three verses are such amazing examples for Christians to actually say that we need the stu to study the very words of God. Because the study, the study of the very words of God is required and so is reading. The study of the very words of God is required and so is teaching. Guess what? If you're learning the Bible, the very words of God, if you're reading the very words of God, the Bible, what you learn means that you're a disciple of Yeshua, not just a convert, which means you have to be like Jesus and be a teacher. So you may not be like me doing podcasts, but it could very well be you're a mom raising a couple of kids. Guess what? There's your class, your children. Or a dad taking your son fishing. Dad, guess what? You may not be leading Bible studies at your church. You may be taking Bible studies. But guess what? Your audience is your son on that fishing trip. So is your church training you? Are they providing Bible classes? Now this is why I'm doing this. This is why I'm doing these podcasts. I am so committed to trying to help myself. I'm getting more out of this, you guys, than you, than you can imagine. And I'm so on fire for this. I've been doing this for years. And I've seen Jesus again and again in the Torah. As I'm relying on great Christian teachers, great Messianic Jewish teachers, and Jewish teachers to help me understand the very words of God. The New Testament was not available in Jesus' day. Jesus' Bible was the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. And so, therefore, we really need to understand Jesus' Bible and how that supports what he was doing in his day. I simply can't help myself. I simply want to share what God has given me so I could give it to you and so that you can do the same and that you can give it to others. So, with that in mind... Let's actually begin chapter 47. Reading again from the New American Standard Version. Starting in 47, we read, Then Joseph went in and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brothers and their flocks and their herds and all that they have have come out of the land of Canaan, and behold, they are in the land of Goshen. He took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? So they said to Pharaoh, your, your servants are shepherds, both we and our fathers. Then he said to Pharaoh, We have come to sojourn in the land, for there is no pasture for your servants' flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. 
Now therefore, please let your servants live in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is at your disposal. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them live in the land of Goshen. And if you know any capable men among them, then put them in charge of my livestock. Now, we already delved into this idea of the Egyptians being being loathsome towards the Hebrews uh, as we looked at those verses in 46. Um, And again, how the Egyptians thought they were superior to anybody else. Now, what's interesting here is Pharaoh had cattle. And he wanted to hire Jacob and his sons to take care of his cattle. So again, I go to Dr. John Kareed and his commentary on Genesis. Genesis, And again, one of the key reasons why I use Dr. John Kareed is he's an Egyptologist. He has studied the culture of Egypt and he has made a comment that if you want to understand the Torah, if you want to understand Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you need to understand Egypt. So he has a commentary here with regards to this offer that Pharaoh made to the sons of Jacob. Pharaoh makes a final offer to Joseph. If there are men of ability among the Hebrews, then he too, then he is to choose them to be superintendents of Pharaoh's cattle. It is well known from ancient records that the Pharaoh owned many herds of cattle, some intended for his court and some for the gods and that there was a complex administration associated with the livestock. Papyrus Harris records the words of Ramses III in the 20th dynasty, early in the 12th century BC, as he extols his own virtues in regard to serving the god Amon. So, that Pharaoh said, I made for the herds in the south and north, containing large cattle, fowl, and small cattle by the hundreds hundreds of thousands, having overseers of cattle, scribes, overseers of the horns, inspectors, and numerous shepherds in charge of them, having cattle fodder, in order to offer them to thy ka at all my feasts, that that thy heart may be uh, satisfied with them, O ruler of gods. So the the official position of overseer of cattle is commonly used in Egypt. So, the very interesting comment on here, again, that the culture of Egypt verifies that this uh, thing of non-Egyptians actually being overseers of Pharaoh's cattle is true, because it seems as if the Egyptians wanted nothing to do with this type of labor. So, picking up in verse 7, then Joseph brought his family, uh, brought his father Jacob and presented him to Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, How many years have you lived? So Jacob said to Pharaoh, The years of my sojourning are 130. Few and unpleasant have been the years of my life, nor have they attained the years that my fathers lived during the days of their sojourning. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out of his presence. So Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had ordered. Joseph provided his father and all his brothers and all his father's household with food according to the little ones. Now in verse 11 it talks about the land of Ramses. And you can say, wait a minute, isn't that Ramses the Great? And it's used by some scholars and some of my fellow Christians to say, see, that means that's the late date of Exodus. Under Ramses the Great, Ramses the Second, in the late 12th century B.C., or maybe the early 13th century B.C. But, over and over again, we have shown that real archaeology and real history is behind the early date of 1446 B.C. 
200 years at least before Ramses the Great. So the question is, what's the explanation? If the early date is 1446 BC, why is Moses using the name Ramses here? Matter of fact, what's very interesting, Moses wasn't even alive during the times of Ramses, if we actually believe that Moses wrote the Torah. Now, there's a great scholarly explanation of this provided by Dr. Charles Ailing, who's a renowned Egyptologist and one of my teachers in Old Testament archaeology at Northwestern University. He wrote a book. It's called Egypt and Bible History by Dr. Charles Ailing from Baker Studies in Biblical Archaeology. And let me give you his explanation of the use of the word Ramses in this specific text. Dr. Ailing says a more attractive explanation of the city named Ramses from the, uh, from the perspective of those who hold to the early date is that the term Ramses uh, re, uh, replaced the older name Avaris in the scriptural text to make the account of the bondage more understandable to later readers who would not know the location of Avaris but would recognize the city by its new name, Ramses. Well, the thing is, what I'm getting at, and I just said this before, we do not have the original Torah. We do not have the original documents from Moses. They've been copied and they've been copied and then be copied again. So the thing is, is that we may be dealing with a copy where the copier said, let's put in the name Ramses because people would be very familiar with this name rather than Avaris, which was lost in history but found by modern archaeology. So in other words, in Jesus' day, in the days of the Maccabees, in the days of Nehemiah and Ezra, when they had looks at copies, of the, they probably would not understand what Avaris was, but Ramses, yes. Similar updating of place names can be seen in other biblical references. So, for instance, in Genesis 14:14, 14, 14, Abraham pursues his enemies to the city called Dan. That's exactly what it's you. That's how exactly it's stated in Hebrew in Genesis 14:14. 14, 14. But we know from Joshua 19:47 and Judges 18:29. These are important verses for you guys. Joshua 19:47 and Judges 18:29 that the city's original name was Laish, or Lashem, and that it was renamed Dan only after the conquest. In Abraham's and Moses' time, the city was called Laish, but after the name had been changed to Dan, the older name was forgotten by the Israelites. Genesis 14, verse 14, was updated to reflect this change. So therefore, Ramses, the use of Ramses in this verse, is a parallel case. So from Moses' day until today, the text was copied and copied again meticulously. I was taught, and I don't have references for this, but I'll tell you something that I was taught by a reliable teacher, Ray Vanderland, uh, in, matter of fact, in Turkey. He was teaching us that, no, matter of fact, it was at uh, Qumran where the Dead Sea Scrolls were written. And he said when they copied the text, there was one who read the text and one who copied the text from what he was hearing the reader say. However, they had checkers. There was one who was a checker of the reader. And while the reader was reading the text, the one behind him would listen to what the reader was saying to make sure he was reading correctly. Then there was one who stood behind the copier and made sure that the copier was copying what the words of the reader, what he was saying, and he'd say it correctly. And this makes a lot of sense, because this is the very words of God, and extra care need to be taken. Now, this could very well be in the archaeological findings of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm not sure. Uh, I trust Ray Vanderland immensely, and uh, this copying process makes a lot of makes a lot of sense so we have one plausible explanation now is this argument conclusive no 
But neither is the argument for those who hold to the late date and the use of the land of Ramses. However, we have a strong argument that indeed it was changed on purpose by later later copiers. It makes sense. Those in Jesus' day knew the city of Dan, but the city of Laish was lost. We only discover the city of Laish based upon archaeology. And once we put two and two together, and we actually studied the word of God carefully, we began to see what was going on. So we're going to continue. We're going to pick up at verse 13 in 47. Now there was no food in all the land because the famine was very severe. So the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. Joseph gathered all the, all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. Now this is important for later. No one had any money anymore. When the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food, for why should we die in your presence, for our money is gone. So nobody had any money, including the second-class Hebrews. Remember, they're second-class citizens. If they had money, it was also gone, because the Egyptians had no money. Then Moses said, Give up your livestock, and I will give you food for your livestock, since your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses and the flocks and the herds and the donkeys. And he fed them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. So it seems as if, did the Hebrews do the same thing and said, here's our flocks that we brought from Canaan, and now we're going to give them to Pharaoh so we can get food. I mean, the famine is still going on. They have to, they have to be fed. When that year was ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent, and the cattle are my Lord's. There is nothing left for my Lord except our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we and our land will be slaves to Pharaoh. So give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land may not be desolate. So again, they're giving up their land. Now, Pharaoh had given land to the Hebrews, but he never sold it to them. He basically said, you can live in the land. He never said, I'm going to let you live in the land and I'm going to give it to you. This is important. So the Hebrews probably had no money. They probably said, okay, Pharaoh, you can have our flocks too. We'll keep, we'll keep tending them. We'll be the overseers and of your flocks as well. And also we're giving up our land, we never had any land. We didn't own Goshen. This is so critical to something that we're going to bring up. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for every Egyptian sold his field because the famine was severe upon them. Thus the land became Pharaoh's. Why not the Hebrews? They're second class citizens. If they even owned the land of Goshen, but they probably didn't. The Bible doesn't say they owned the land. They could live in the land, but the Torah doesn't say they owned it. As for the people, remove them to the cities from one end of Egypt's border to the other. Only the land of the priest he did not buy, for the priest had an allotment from Pharaoh, and they lived off the allotment, allotment which Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their land. Then Joseph said to the people, Behold, I today have bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now here is seed for you, and may, uh, and may sow the land, and may you sow the land. At the harvest you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh, and four-fifths shall be your own for seed of the field, and for your food, and for those of your households, and as food for your little ones. So they said, You have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, and we shall be Pharaoh's slaves. Joseph made it a statute concerning the land of Egypt, valid to this day, that Pharaoh should have the fifth. Only the land of the priests did not become Pharaoh's. Now, just as a comment on verse 26, Dr. John Kareed, a very credible and renowned and proven Egyptologist and theologian and archaeologist, in his Torah commentary, 
Nahum Serna, a deeply religious Jewish scholar who was the author of the commentary in the JPS Torah commentary, the Jerusalem Publication Society commentary on Genesis. He, along with Kareed, along with the authors of the uh, IVP Bible background commentary on the Old Testament, all of them agree that a 20% tax is not excessive in the ancient Near East. It was common. Now, another thing, though, is very interesting, is that in verses 20 to 22, Joseph bought all the land, so basically... Pharaoh had all the land and control of the land. And on top of that, all the people were moved into the cities. And the implication is, Egypt fell under centralized governmental control. Now what's amazing is, there was a Pharaoh, his name was Sen Usret III. His reign was 1878 to 1843 BC. He was a great Pharaoh of the 12th dynasty. He did the same thing. He took away the control and the land from the governors and all the people and centralized the control in Egypt. This is an historical event that's so similar to what Joseph did. Now, Joseph's second in command. So it's probably Joseph didn't do this on his own. He's got to be in sync with Pharaoh. He serves Pharaoh. He obeys Pharaoh. He's a servant to Pharaoh. So historically, we could say that Pharaoh is the one who basically ordered this and knew about this, working with Joseph in order to do the things that were necessary to help the people live. Because remember what the people said here. We just read it. You've saved us. But there's so much more. I did a paper on biblical dating, and it's based on the proven work of Dr. Edwin Thilley. This, this is amazing. And I'm not teaching my opinion in this. I am teaching the actual archaeological historical record and the things that have actually been discovered. You, you will be amazed. In this paper, we're going to find real archaeology and history to support the date of Exodus of 1446 B.C. You're going to find real archaeology and history to show that in 2091 B.C., Abraham entered Canaan when he was 75. We're going to take a look at the dates when Joseph entered Egypt when he was 17. We're going to find out that it was 1916 B.C. and so much more. In this paper, we're going to see that Joseph served under a number of pharaohs. He entered Egypt under Amen Emhat II. In 1916 BC, Amen Emhat II died in 1895 when Joseph was 21. Then the pharaoh is Senusret II from 1897 to 1878 and during that time Joseph became 30 years old in 1886 BC so under censorate the second Joseph was 30 and began to serve under Pharaoh censorate the second dies in 1878 then it's censorate the th sen Usaret the third who we just talked about who actually took away all the land from the people and the governors and centralized government from 1878 to 1839, then followed by Amenhemhat III in 1860 to 1814 BC, and finally Amenhemhat IV from 1850 to 1806. And it just so happens that Joseph died at 110 years old in 1806 BC under Amenhotep IV. This is amazing. We've got these dates. And wait till you see the archaeology that proves this. It's amazing. So again, check the links in the comment section to access this paper. And once again, we're studying the very words of God. We're taking a look at the historicity of God's word, the veracity of God's word, and its trustworthiness. Once again, guys, 
we see that the study of the very words of God in their historical context is critical for us as true disciples of Yeshua. And now we come to finish chapter 47 with a verse that is going to blow us away and gives us a setup for the Exodus and the book of Exodus. Starting in verse 27 where we left off, we read, Now Israel lived in the land of Egypt and Goshen, and they acquired property in it. Now this is interesting. Acquired property? Huh. Wait a minute. We just read what Joseph did to all the Egyptians. How much more would he do it to non-citizens, to second-class people, people who were looked down upon? How could they acquire property when everybody had sold their property to Pharaoh? This makes no sense. It, it, it. And they were fruitful and became very numerous. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the length of Jacob's life was one, for 147 years. When the time for Israel to die drew near, he called on his son Joseph and said to him, Please, if I have found favor in your sight, please now place your hand under my thigh and deal with me in kindness and faithfulness. Please do not bury me in Egypt. But when I lie down with my fathers, you shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he said, I will do as you have said. Joseph will bury his father at the cave of Machpelah, where Sarah and, uh, where Sarah and Abraham were buried, and Rebekah and Isaac. So Jacob said, and he said, swear to me. So he swore to him that Israel bowed in worship at the head of the bed. So we come now to verse 27, and we must look at the phrase acquired property. Again, we've already seen this is contradicting everything that Joseph had just done. Now, in my studies for a class years ago, I was teaching, that I was teaching, uh, for some reason I had to study this phrase acquired property, and I was looking at many Torah commentaries, and I looked at the Orthodox Jewish commentary, the Orthodox Rabbinic Jewish commentary called the Chumash, which comes from the word Hamesh, which is five. And like I said, I can't remember what drove me to the uh, Orthodox, but I always check out the Orthodox Rabbinic commentary because in many cases they have insights, they have thoughts, they have ideas that few commentators have, and we need to consider those. Sometimes they're anti-biblical. Sometimes their midrash is so off the map that we have to dismiss it. But in this case, this begins to make sense, and it's very enlightening. So, as we go into the Humash, Looking at the commentary on verse 27, the Orthodox rabbinic scholars say they acquired property in it. Not content with the land that Joseph had given them, they bought more and more land. Now this is one opinion of Ibn Ezra, a famous Middle, Age or Middle, Middle Ages uh, Jewish scholar, an indication that they were no longer regarding themselves as aliens who were sojourning in Egypt, but as permanent residents. Problem. The Hebrews were the Hebrews. They were non-Egyptian. They were second-class citizens. So again, Ibn Ezra has an interesting opinion, but the thing is it, it, it actually contradicts what the culture in Egypt was. Another Midrash renders that they were grasped by the land. They didn't buy the land, but they were grasped by the, the, the land held them, implying that they could not leave why couldn't they leave? That's my question. To make sure that they would remain there as long as was necessary to fulfill the prophecy made to Abraham about persecution and enslavement. I got a funny feeling if they were grasped by the land, they were grasped by the richness and glory and power of Egypt. The final commentary in here, this was further implica uh, implication that Israel slowly became grasped by the Egyptian culture. Grasped by the Egyptian culture. Egyptian culture in the sense that they had begun to slide into assimilation. Now when we look at the Hebrew they acquired property that's in English. 
when we actually go into the Hebrew, the word that they acquired property, the word property is not even there. It's not even used. The word there is veya achaktsu. It's from the Hebrew word achaz, which uh, has a Strong's number of H270, which means to hold, to seize, to take, to adhere to, or to join. But the word property is not even used in the Hebrew. The word property, mikna, which is Strong's number 4735, or rekush, Strong's number 7399, is not even used in the sentence. So they weren't acquiring property, but something. They were holding on to something. They were joining something. They were adhering to something. And on top of that, we just read in 47 that nobody owned land anymore. We just read that Pharaoh said you can live in the land of Goshen, but he never gave it, he never gave it to them. He just said you can live in this land. But it wasn't theirs. I think the Orthodox rabbinic scholars are really onto something when they say basically the Hebrews were assimilating into the Egyptian culture. It's so related to when we study the Hebrew word veye akaktu to join, to adhere to, to become part of. And all of a sudden assimilation began to make a lot of sense. Let's just take a look at Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. So we're going to jump over to Exodus. There's a statement in here that's very important. Now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died, and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God, and God heard their groaning. When we take a look at this verse, we recognize that it does not say they cried out to God. God heard them. Oh yeah, that's clear. But nowhere does it say, and they cried out to God. Nowhere does it say that they cried out to, using God's name, Yahweh. They just cried out. Now, if the rabbis are right, and the Hebrews that assimilated and began to connect to the false gods of Egypt, perhaps they were crying out and they didn't know which god of the Egyptians would be able to save them. So was it possible they had integrated into the Egyptian culture? Let's take a look at some verses. We go to Joshua chapter 24. And in Joshua chapter 24... We go through verse 14, and we read Joshua talking to the Egyptians. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Serving gods in Egypt. Now beyond the river does not mean the, the uh, river Jordan. There is Wadi El Arish, which you can actually look up. And that was called the Egyptian River. And it was kind of a uh, natural separation point between Canaan and the Egyptian territory and the Sinai. And that was known as the river, beyond the river. In other words, yeah, you belong in Canaan, Israel, but the thing is, is that beyond the river is Egypt, and that's where they were serving gods. So your fathers, the generation that was in Egypt had assimilated. They were worshiping the gods of Egypt. Then we go to Deuteronomy and we go to chapter 32 verses 15 through 17. But Yeshurun grew fat and kicked. Yeshurun is just another word for Israel. You are grown fat, thick, and sleek. Then he, meaning Israel, forsook God who made him and scorned the rock of his salvation. They made him jealous with strange gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons who were not God, to gods whom they have not known, new gods who came lately, whom your fathers did not dread. This is Egypt. 
Egypt was sacrificing to Egyptian gods and God is calling pagan gods demons. They, they simulated into the culture. The Bible is proving this to be true. Then we go to Ezekiel 20, verses 5 through 8. These are some really awesome verses. So in Ezekiel 20, verses 5 through 8, we read, And say to them, thus says the Lord God, On the day when I chose Israel and swore to the descendants of the house of Jacob and made myself known to them in the land of Egypt, when I swore to them, saying, I am the Lord your God, on that day I swore to them to bring them out from the land of Egypt into a land that I had selected for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. I said to them, cast away each of you the detestable things of his eyes, and do not defile yourself with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God, but they rebelled against me and were not willing to listen to me. They did not cast away the detestable things of their eyes, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. So in Genesis 47, 27, they began to adhere, to join, to assimilate, to become part of. It makes so much sense because it fits the rest of the text in context. What's interesting, one of my teachers, his opinion is when we read Ezekiel 25 through 8, Perhaps we're seeing why God allowed the Hebrews to fall into slavery because they purposely turned against God and worshiped the false gods, the demons of Egypt. So once you put all this together, the rabbi's assessment in the Chumash that they had assimilated makes a lot of sense. It's so related to the phrase, and you may have heard this, for the Lord... It is easy to take Israel out of Egypt, but it's not so easy for the Lord to take Egypt out of Israel. The verse 47, 27, where they said Israel acquired property. As we study it, it becomes a critical verse. We see how the rich, awesome, powerful, and glorious kingdom of Egypt perhaps blinded God's people seems so related to the verse that we've heard that money is the root of all evil the love of money is the root of all evil not money but the love of money and very much like us today in the united states many of us have seen how many churches have turned from the lord the lord and his word how they've assimilated into the paganness around us became secularized there are churches today that embrace the support of abortion they support child mutilation in this craziness of our days of child sexual identity if a boy five-year-old says i'm a girl they can actually be in some places be allowed to be surgically changed this is nuts simulation And so we finally come to 47 and the last few verses. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. When the time for Israel to draw near, he called his son Joseph and said to him, Please, if I have found favor in your sight, place now your hand under my thigh and deal with me in kindness and faithfulness. Please do not bury me in Egypt. But when I lie down with my fathers, you shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place, meaning the cave of Machpelah. And he said, I will do as you said. And Jacob said, swear to me. So he swore to him that Israel bowed in worship at the head of the bed. So Jacob, Israel, wants, does not want to be buried in Egypt. You know, he is the only one of the family, of all of them, who actually saw God? We have to believe God's word. Genesis 32, 30, Jacob had just wrestled with the strange, mysterious man at night. And then later on, he names the place Peniel, because this is the place I have seen God face to face. 
God talked to Jacob. He talked to him in Genesis 46, right at the beginning of the chapter, on his way down to Egypt. God said, yes, I'm with you, Jacob, but I will bring you back. God talked to Jacob at a place called Bethel. Jacob uh, named the place Bethel, the house of God. This was back in Genesis 28, starting in verse 12. And here God speaks the covenant that he gave to Jacob's grandfather. He's the only one that seemingly know this because the Torah is silent to the fact that Jacob taught his people. Now, now you, if you're a, a Hebrew coming out of Egypt, things are becoming clearer. They now see, after Moses wrote the Torah, how they got to Egypt and how they were enticed, how their forefathers were enticed by the power and riches of Egypt to forsake God. They see how important teaching is. Jacob never taught his family. He never instructed them in the covenant, never implanted in them the fear of the Lord, the one and only, the only, the one and only true God. Never did Jacob dissuade them not to fall for the riches and the power and the glory and the false gods of Egypt. Joseph and his brothers and their families never left Egypt. They had assimilated into the culture. This is quite amazing as we come here to almost the end of the saga of Joseph and the end of Genesis. We still have a number of chapters to go, so I will see you in Lesson 99. And we'll remember in Luke 24, 50 that Jesus lifted up his hands to bless his 120 disciples before he ascended the Father, just like the high priest daily lifts up his hands. It could very well be that Jesus blessed them with the ironic blessing. I've taken the ironic blessing and I've turned it into a prayer. I'd like to end our session with that blessing, that blessing that's based upon the high priestly blessing that God gave to Moses, to Aaron, to bless the people. Yevarekeinu Adonai Vishmarkenu, Yair Adonai Panava Alenu, Bekunekinu, Isa Adonai Panava Lenu, Viasem Lanu Shalom, Vishem Yeshua Adonenu, Amen. So together, let's say this in English. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us, and may he give us his shalom. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.